Amen. Thank you. Beautiful way to ring in worship this morning. Well, good morning, friends. What a glorious day God has given us. A beautiful fall morning, nice crispness when we wake up this morning to get us going and ready for worship. I welcome you in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm Pam Anderson, the pastor of Congregational Care here at Beulah. And I'm happy to be worshiping with you today. And I especially want to welcome any guests that we have this morning. If you're a guest, please fill out a Connect card, or if you're joining us online for the first time, or just want to drop a note and a comment and say hello, we'd appreciate it to know that you're here. One of the things about Beulah Church is we like to help people grow in their faith. And we do that by living into our vision of seek, share, and serve. Seek is what we're doing right now and what we do on our Wednesday night worship meals. So we gather and we seek God in different ways. And we serve in the many ways that we reach out as a com into the community as a community and as the church of Christ. And then we share in our small groups like we do on Sunday mornings, in Sunday school, or in our women's circles. And for more information about how you can connect with the church, check your bulletin because we have a couple pages of stuff. Fall is always an exciting time. A lot of energy going on, a lot of ways that you can help and connect and just hang out and gather together as a community. And with that, I'd like to lift up a couple of the announcements and draw your attention to them. First, I want to raise up the sweet potato orders and talent surveys are due in today. This is a great way for you to support our Fall Bazaar, which is a, is a really wonderful opportunity for the church to reach out to the community and give back and to engage the community directly. We also have, um, let's see, do we have one up there? Okay. Yep, crop. Crop Hunger Walk. It's the 52nd annual Richmond Crop Hunger Walk, and it's going to be on November 13th. So please consider joining the Beulah team. Barbara Tuttle is going to be in the Narthex for more information after service. And then this Friday, Spirit Squad is having a fall gathering, and all are welcome for fellowship, food, and fun. We're going to be having um, pumpkin decorating, food, and some friendly costume contests. So bring a friend, invite a neighbor, let them know that we're having this activity Friday night, sign up and at, after service, or shoot us an email. And one of our favorite fall topics is trunk or treat. Raising this up for Pastor Daniel, if you have any questions about that, see Pastor Daniel, but we really want to try and get people to participate in the, in the trunks. That's a great way for our neighbors to come in and see and engage with us. It's one of our big events for the fall season, and it's just a lot of fun. If you can do a trunk, please sign up. We're looking to get about 20 trunks. Right now, I think we're at 16, so we need a few more. Really appreciate it. And also candy. You can still drop off your candy. We'll be asking for that, those donations throughout. And Trunk or Treat is going to be actually on Halloween as an alternative for kids to knock on doors. They can come to a safe environment here at the church. And finally, a quick reminder. Um, keep up with your Bible readings, and if you need an October list, they can be found on the information table out at the front. And this morning, I'd also like to invite up uh, Sandy Lunsford from SPRC for a special message. And invite Pastor Daniel down. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. In recognition of Pastor Appreciation Month, I'd like to present a token of appreciation from Staff Parish to Pastor Don. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Dan. Thank you very much. And Pastor Pam. Thank you. We certainly appreciate everything they do for us, and we are blessed to have them as our pastors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, church. I told the 8.30 service that there's not a day that goes by that I don't feel appreciated by you. So thank you for the additional cards and letters and love uh, that you show us in this month of October. But thank you for being who you are every day of the year. God bless you. And now we move on to worship, which is the foundation of our Christian identity. It expresses our highest purpose. Lex Arandi, 
Lex Credendi, Lex Vivendi. As we worship, so we believe, and so we live. Worship reveals what we truly believe and how we view ourselves in relationship to God and to one another and to the world as we're sent to carry out the redemptive mission of Jesus Christ. How the church worships is a prophetic witness to the truth of what we profess. Good worship becomes a dynamic means of drawing the entire human community together in the fullness of Jesus Christ. And with that, please stand as you're able for our call to worship. The words can be found on the screen. I will read the leader and you will read the people. Make a full and joyful noise to the Lord, all you people. With shouts of joy, we celebrate the good news of God's love. Open your hearts to the warmth of God's redeeming love. God has poured such wonder into our lives. Come, let us worship God with hearts and souls and voices. Let our praise ring to the raptors and ascend to the heavens. Amen. Amen. This morning, church, I invite you to remain standing as you were able. We're going to lift our voice in song, going back to our roots, remembering that our victory is in Jesus. We began this morning announcing to the world around us that we are victorious by the blood, the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Turn as you are able to 370 and you're ready. I'm going to invite you to join me in singing all the verses. You'll note that I have swallowed a frog this weekend and I'm unable to sing loudly, so you need to do additional work in lifting your voice this morning in praise. 370, all the verses, victory in Jesus.
song that gets your heart pumping, right? We are reminded that we have been plunged into victory. There's a promise for every single one of us, and that doesn't put a smile on our face. I don't know what can, church. Our neighbor with a smile on our face to our left and our right and say, I've been plunged into victory. Amen. And if you've been plunged into victory this morning, you may have a seat. In the prayers of the people, let us pray. Almighty God, we're so thankful for how good you are to us each and every day and the many ways that you provide for us and guide us. We come together to worship you, to love and thank you for all of the answered prayers. And we trust in you as we join together as the body of Christ, requesting mercy for our church family and our neighbors. We lift up prayers for those on our continuous prayer list as they struggle with long-term health issues, God. Surround Roy Hartless, Kathy Roberts, Betty Donovan, Donna File, with healing prayers, your love and your presence to help them fight illnesses, God. We pray for a positive news during Nancy Cowarden's doctor visit this week, Lord. And God, surround Aaron Harris and Patsy Hayden with the power of your love and strength as they fight health issues. Lord, we continue to pray for Chad and Joan Spencer, and we ask for comfort and healing prayers for Joanne Clark, Donnie Foster, Diana Haver. God, we lift up Marion and Virginia Lawhorn. We send them comfort and strength and healing prayers. And God, we pray along with broken hearts with the people of Taiwan as they mourn the loss of so many young souls and adults that lost their lives in the child care center. Lord, we pray for those suffering and continuing to be challenged by Hurricane Ian, especially the weak and the ill who struggle to find assistance on their own. In the name of Jesus, we pray for all of those with unspoken prayers around the world, in our community, in our church family. Let them be guided by your spirit and let them know and feel your presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. As we continue to lift up our thanks and love to you in gratefulness and humbleness, we join together in prayer as you taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And at this time, I'd like to invite our ushers down as we move to tithes and offering. And be reminded that one way that your giving provides grace upon this church is in support of youth ministries. And if you're interested in learning more about those programs, see Pastor Daniel. Now let us prepare our hearts for giving our tithes and offerings.
you stand for the singing of the rock song? we thank you. We do praise you as we gather these gifts of heart and life. We invite that you bless and receive these gifts, Lord, that it would be for us a joy to be found faithful in service to your kingdom. God bless, receive these, we ask, in the name of Christ Jesus. Bless and receive us, we ask, in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Church, you may be seated, and you, as you are seated, I invite Ad, <clears throat> Ann Williams to come here for us, a portion of scripture for this Sunday morning. From the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verses 36 through 42, hear now the word of the Lord. Yes, we can, Pastor Dan. So we're going to invite the children to go out with Pastor Daniel. Thank you, Pastor Pam. <clears throat> Cold medicine at its best effect. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Pam, for being on your toes and... Uh, and for being prepared to read. So now here, Matthew chapter 26, 24, verse 36 through 42. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, People were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill one will be taken and the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God, and thank you, Anne, for sharing that word. As you heard that portion of scripture this morning, I want to invite you to hold one thought, one word in thought, a word that stood out to me when I preparation for our Sunday morning sermon, one word that stood out to me is prepared. How many of you like to be prepared? Most of us like to be prepared. And thinking about the word prepared, I was excited to gather with my family this weekend to celebrate the birthday of our eldest child. And as a part of that birthday celebration, we were out to dinner and then back to the house where we had our tradition of singing happy birthday with candles to be blown out. <clears throat> Following that birthday celebration, there were albums, photo albums, that were brought out to remember that incredible occasion. And it was there when looking at the birth pictures of my firstborn child, when I was at the mere age of 25 years old, that I remembered all the preparing for that special day. The preparing. We were prepared. We had a little nursery. It wasn't incredibly large, but it was clean. It was prepared. We had purchased the appropriate car seat that is now outlawed because it's not safe enough. We had worked hard to find. We love antiques. We wanted an old fashioned antique baby bed that now is not allowed to be used because the bars are too far apart. But we found one. You'll probably remember these wooden framed bed was the metal um, sort of springs for a baby bed. And then you had the little lever on the side that you push with your foot and the bed side would go up and down. We sanded that baby bed for weeks on end. Christy expecting our first child, I would come home from work and we would sit outside on our back porch with sandpaper and sand and sand and sand. We wanted to be prepared so when that little one made her entrance into the world, 
Mom and dad were ready. Diaper bag was packed. Diapers had been purchased. We had baby showers. The church had baby showers. The family had baby showers. My work had a baby shower. We were ready. And I remember as she was born, pictures were being taken, the nurse taking pictures. I reminded my children that cell phones did not exist in that day. So you'd take a camera with you in there. The nurse took a picture, and there's a picture of me of a young 25-year-old dad holding my first child. And in my heart, my thoughts were, I don't think I'm prepared for this. Anybody ever felt that way? But we're prepared. The bed is ready, and the room is ready, and the diaper bag's ready, and the car seat's in the car, and the blankie to carry the baby home in, and everything's ready. But when I was handed that child, my first thoughts were, I don't think I'm ready for this. I don't think I'm ready. But I was prepared. Christ is moving toward the end of his earthly ministry in the scripture text today. We've been reading together as a church the book of Matthew, and we're in the final stages of Christ's earthly ministry, his teaching. Just in a few chapters ahead, in chapter 26, Christ is anointed for his death. He speaks to his disciples about preparing a space for Passover, which we know will eventually become the Last Supper. There's a plot to arrest Christ and a plan to crucify him. But we're not quite there that, that, yet, that we're not quite there yet. In the scripture text this morning, we're moving in that direction. He's teaching his disciples about what's to come. He is inviting them, says verse 42. Therefore, keep watch. In Greek, this word literally means be awake, be alert, be prepared. For the day is at hand when there shall be the trumpet sound and the return of Christ. I did some interesting research this week on the return of Christ. For me, astounding information was to be gathered. I did not know much of this information. It was both exciting and alarming. Holding the thought, are we prepared? Of the 46 Old Testament prophets, less than 10 of them speak of the first coming of Christ. However, 36 of them speak of the second coming of Christ. There are, are over 1,500 Old Testament passages that refer in some way to the second coming of Christ the King. One out of every 25 New Testament verses directly refers to the second coming of Christ. For every time the Bible mentions the first coming, the Advent, the Christmas story that we all love because it's baby Jesus, for every one time the Bible mentions the first coming of Christ, it mentions, listen church, the second coming of Christ eight times. For every one time we're told that a child will be born to a virgin, eight times we hear he's going to return. I was baffled by that. That's astounding. For every time we're promised the child to be born, we're reminded eight times over that child shall return as the conquering king of kings. For every time the Bible mentions Christ once in his coming, he's mentioned eight times in his return for us. For each time the atonement, meaning our redemption, for every single time our redemption is mentioned in the Bible, the second coming is mentioned twice. Every time we're reminded that Christ atones for our sin, we're reminded that two times over he's coming to receive those who are atoned. And so this is the major theme of all of Scripture, the second coming of Christ. Now we as a church get excited about the first coming of Christ because we love that little baby in the manger. We can prepare for that, and that involves going to Target and Walmart and shopping and all the excitement of lights and packages and good food and family fun and time together. But the invitation of Christ in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42 is this. 
prepare yourself. Keep watch. Are you alert? Are you awake? Because you know what? He's coming again. Just as he was promised and we celebrate the first coming for every time mentioned once of that coming eight times over we're reminded that he's coming again now when my first child was born i thought i was prepared but as that first week turned into the first month i realized there was a few things i had missed one was how would i calculate the ability to work full time on no sleep Anybody remember those days? How do you calculate now that you have no personal free time with you and your spouse? Everything revolves around that little baby. Getting in the car and going somewhere was so easy before it involved a car seat and a diaper bag and a bottle and a change of clothes and a pacifier. Right? We thought we were prepared. And we've become parents many times over. In thinking about what it means to be prepared and understanding in this Bible literacy campaign, our invitation is to be a people of the Word. It's important that we understand that for one time we're promised that the Christ will come and dwell among us as Emmanuel, God with us. Eight times over, we're reminded that He will come again to claim His bride the church, those who've been atoned and redeemed. He will come again, says the Word. And so I thought this week, what's a practical understanding of this preparation? How is it that I want to be prepared for the second coming of Christ? I remember growing up in a small country church in South Tennessee. In our youth group, we practiced for the rapture. I may have told you this before. Our youth leader would say, rapture practice, and we would all jump because we were prepared for the coming of Christ. Now, that may be, in your mind, overkill or very juvenile. But I thought to myself this morning, in the day and the age in which we live, not unlike that of a time of Noah, how is it that we, the body of Christ, individuals, need to be prepared for the second coming of Christ? It's not a topic you hear very often in the church these days. We like the baby Jesus. We like the decorating for Advent. We love the Advent candle readings. They're so precious and sweet. But eight times over, we're reminded there's a call for us to be prepared. I began to think about what it would mean for me to be prepared for the second coming of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. First, I believe we need to live in the light of His first coming. If I want to be prepared for the second coming of Christ, I need to live in light of his his first coming, literally meaning I live like, I live my life every day like the first coming really mattered. It really meant something. It's more than just a Christmas celebration. It is a gift of God for the atoning of the world. Do I live every day in the light of the first coming? Jesus spoke parables about his return in Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 27. He told about a nobleman who traveled to a faraway land to become a king. The nobleman called ten servants. He gave them each coins, and he said, I am going to come back, and when I do, I want you to have used these for the building of the kingdom here. I want you to multiply them. Put them to good use, and I'm going to ask for an accounting of all your business affairs when I return. The Word of God tells us that the parable of Christ said, He returned. The first two servants had productive uses of their coins, and they presented triple what had been entrusted to them. But another servant had done nothing. He simply wrapped that coin in a cloth, and he hid it away for safekeeping. His mistake was that he didn't act on what he professed he believed. He professed something about this master, but he didn't live by and he lost his reward. Being prepared for the second coming of Christ means I live in the light of the first coming. I understand that first coming means something, and it matters. It matters. It was an investment in me, and it matters. Those who profess Christ as their Lord and live according to the profession will receive the great reward at the return of Christ. 
To be prepared for the second coming means I understand and live as if the first coming, coming of Christ really matters. It changes everything. God with us, Emmanuel. The second thing I thought would be important in my life, if I were to truly live prepared for the second coming of Christ, is that I would be discerning. Twice in the book of Mark, Christ warned his disciples not to be led astray by false claims. More than 77 times, Christ gives the instructions in the New Testament to be careful to what you listen to. Be careful to who it is you're following because they are leading you astray. If you hear more than just the voice of the master first, you're going to live in a confused state. Christ warned his disciples not to be led astray by false claims. Watch out that no one deceives you. False prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders and lead you astray. If possible, Christ says, if possible, and we know it's possible, be grounded in what you know is the truth. Here's the truth. How are you living in that truth? How are you walking in that truth? How is that truth for you what matters in the everyday of life? Christ says, don't be led astray by false witness. The truth is before you. Paul warned, and I have a wet Bible. I spilled my tea under there. There was another baptism service under the pulpit this morning. Paul warned, now concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and being gathered to him, don't let anyone deceive you. Why would Paul and Jesus have this continual command to not be deceived, lest it is we easily be deceived? They understood. We are easily deceived. We're easily led astray. We are easily captivated by the beautiful things around us in the world. The warning of Scripture is consistent. Use discernment and listening to those who have leadership over you. Figure it out through the Word of God. Be open to the invitation of the Holy Spirit to lead you first and be discerning. Third, in this process of being prepared, what is it that I need to have but hope? I would say don't lose hope in the preparing. We were hopeful that when we traveled to the hospital there would be a baby who would return to us and change our life. And believe you me, it changed our life. But we were hope-filled. I daily sanded that baby bed because I was full of hope that at the end of that nine months, there would be for us an incredible blessing. In the weeks that followed that birth, when, birth, when there was little sleep, it was the hope that that child brought to my life that gave me the ability to get up and go to work. Because now that this little thing was in my life, I wanted that little thing to have the best, the best daddy, the best support, the best love. So when there was no sleep to be had, hope got me up every morning. Paul reminds Titus that Jesus' first coming brought us salvation. And then he instructs Titus on how to live. Listen, church, sensibly, righteous, and godly. That's how we live. That's our hope. We live sensibly righteous and godly lives in the present age, blessed with the full hope and the expectation of Jesus' return. Now, you may say to me this morning, well, Pastor Don, I don't know that I'm so filled with hope about Jesus' return. It's a little scary to me. It's a little bit scary. I want to remind you this morning that our only hope is in the expectation of the one who comes to claim us as his own. That's our hope. That's our first hope, our foundation hope. Fourth, in this preparing for the coming of Christ, what are we to do but to encourage one another? The promise that the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout in 1 Thessalonians is followed up with this command. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. You see, that's supposed to be encouragement. Get ready, church. The Lord's going to descend with a mighty shout, and we're supposed to say, we're encouraged. But sadly, the response of a church today is, we're not ready. We're unprepared. We're ill-prepared. 
The promise that the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout is followed up with this command. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Again, affirmation that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night in 1 Thessalonians is followed up with this exhortation. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up in these very words. Scripture's teachings about the second coming are not given to satisfy our personal satisfaction with the future, but to encourage us. It's our hope. It's our foundational hope. And then I thought, what else? How else can I be prepared? I'm going to live as if today matters. I'm going to live as if today matters, and I'm going to live as if today is the day. Anybody remember the movie 2012? There was this prediction based on an ancient culture, maybe the Mayan Indians, when the calendar just stopped in 2012, that the end of the world was coming in 2012. I remember picking my daughter up from middle school, and of course, at the middle school, that was the conversation. It's the end of the world, 2012. And I remember her pouring her heart out and crying, Daddy, is it really the end of the world? I'm so scared. And that very day, a saint of our church, Doris McClear, was promoted to glory. She had battled a short battle with cancer. My daughter didn't know that Miss Doris had died that morning. I'd been at the hospital with Miss Doris, and I saw her promoted in the presence of God. And I said today, I'm not certain, sweetie, if today's the day that the world's going to end. But it's okay. Because for somebody today, the world did end. And they're with Jesus. Miss Doris went to be with Jesus. So we got to live today as if it's our last day. And be prepared that if the Lord comes with a shout and claims us, or we pass away from another illness, we're ready. So we're going to live today like today's the day, and we're prepared. If we're not careful, the day in Christ's return leads us, church, to a spirit of apathy. Hadn't happened for 2,000 years, who cares? It's really not going to happen. We become complacent. Living in the expectation that Christ will return compels us to live every day as if today is the day. And listen, when we live every day like today's the day, we live as if it matters. Are you living today like it matters? What really matters but eternity? Nothing lasts but eternity. I remember a friend of mine said, Don, you have a unique theology, but I think it's true. The best investment you can make in this world is people. Because nothing lasts for eternity but people. The best investment you can make is in people. How you live your life as a follower of Jesus Christ, investing in them and bearing witness in them because your home won't be there and your car won't be there, and your 401k won't be there, and your beach vacations won't be there, but people will be there. I want to live today as if it really matters. And lastly, I thought, and until that day, what am I supposed to do? I've got to keep on doing the work that Jesus left for me to do. And until that day, I want to keep on keeping on and doing what God has called me and each of us to do. Jesus warned the troubling events were just around the corner. Jesus warned troubling events are just around the corner. The end of the age is near. Anybody look at the world around us today and wonder, how much longer, Lord? How much longer? Christ knew that just around the corner there would be a plot for his eventual death. And yet he gave all this promise of hope to his disciples, including persecution. Then he added that nothing, not even persecution, should distract us from the necessary thing. Preach the gospel. Live the gospel. Do what God has called you to do until God calls you. Before ascending to heaven, Jesus gave the church its marching orders. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes you and you will be my witnesses it was declarative it was not a question of do you want to be check the box if you like a b c or d in any of these categories it was an imperative statement 
you're going to be my witnesses. And then he says, you're going to do it everywhere, here, there, and all over the world. The very next verse reports that the disciples stood there looking up into the sky with their mouths hanging open. Like many of us do. And then two angels from heaven came and said, why are you standing there gazing in heaven? Jesus is coming back. So get busy. That's the true account. The disciples are standing there at the ascension dumbfounded. And two angels say, uh, what are you waiting for? Go do what he's told you to do. He just promised you that he would be with you forever. He would empower you to do it. Now go be faithful. So as I sat at my desk this week, I thought of the summation of how it is I want to be prepared. I'm going to live in the light of the first coming. I'm going to be a discerning person, studying the Word of God and being knowledgeable, digesting. I'm going to find hope. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to live as if today's the day and then it really matters. And then I'm going to keep on doing what God has called me to do. The invitation for you this morning, too, is to do what God has called you to do. And maybe you're saying, mm, I don't know what that is. I guarantee you, <clears throat> if you get into this, you're going to find out what it is that God's called you to do. Church, there's no question. Someone said to me after the service, wow, no one ever preaches on the second coming as if it's not going to happen. I can say from the deep chambers of my heart, let it be today, Lord Jesus. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Let today be the day that you call us home. Lord Jesus, even so, let it be today. Are we prepared? Yes, God, we're prepared. We thought we were prepared for that little nine-pound, 11-ounce baby. And she rocked our world. I want to ask you this morning, has God and the love of Jesus Christ rocked your world to the point that you're prepared? You're living in the light of the first coming. You're discerning. You're full of hope. You're encouraging one another. You're living as today, today like it matters for eternity, and you're doing what God has called you to be and do, a witness of the gospel. Jesus Christ, we come before you this morning, and God, we want to be prepared we don't think about it often, God, because the world around us captivates us with all the stuff, and we lose sight of our own eternity. But God, this morning, we thank you for the word that reminds us eight times over for every promise of your arrival that you will come again. Eight times for every one time of promise that you're with us, you're going to come for us. So God, our prayer this morning is that you find us prepared being prepared, getting out that sandpaper, Lord, sanding down those areas of our life that don't look like who you are, buying that car seat, buying those bumper pads, preparing those diapers, because, God, we're in expectant hope of something really good and life-changing. We pray that your work in us would not be just of this day, Lord, but every day into our future. Come now, Lord Jesus, is our prayer. We thank you and we praise you, God. We long for you, God. We look for you, God. And until we find you fully and see you fully, God, find us faithfully bearing witness to the hope that is in us in Jesus Christ. We ask our prayer in the name of the one who died and rose for us. Amen. Amen. Church, I want to ask you, do you believe that God is good? Do you believe that God's promises are for you? And then do what God has called you to do. This morning we have a great opportunity to celebrate life. And I better look at my order of service so I don't... We have a great opportunity to celebrate life and new life. And maybe you've mentioned, you've noticed the last couple of weeks a little baby among us named Luna. 
O.C. and Carenza are extended family of the Harrises, Al and Sherry Harris. And Carenza came to church when she was expecting baby Luna one Sunday. And the Harrises were welcomed as members. And she said to me, I have never felt so loved and welcomed in a church. Everybody was so kind. So baby's been born, and I've met with them in my office, and they've had her in the nursery for a couple of weeks, and they said, we want to make a statement of our faith over her life, Pastor Don, and we would like to have her baptized. And so I'm going to invite O.C. and Carenza and their family to come this morning, Jackie and y la abuela también. O.C.'s mom's here. And Al and Sherry Harris, all come forward, please. I'd invite you to bring a hymn book with you, Carenza, if you have one there on page 39. What's unique about this day is we're thanking God for the work that God has already done in the life of Luna. Before Luna was ever born, before any of us were born, Christ went to Calvary for our sins. He died for us. And so we're going to celebrate today that work already done for baby Luna. And we're going to invite her parents to take the responsibility to raise her and pray for her. And then as a church family, you know our liturgy invites that we are responsible to support them and encourage them in their own Christian faith and leading Luna uh, to understand who God is. She's already had her indoctrination in the nursery where she's loved and the nursery workers and, and all the other little children love baby Luna, and we want to do the same thing. So we want to support this young family and this extended family. Um, did you want to invite your friends to come forward too? Or did Everybody's welcome, guys, if you want to come up. Oh, thank you all. Thank you, thank you all for being here and supporting them. So <clears throat> this morning we're going to celebrate, and we have O.C.'s mom here too. Bendiciones, hermana. Yo sé que es importante ser la abuela. It's important to be the grandmother. So I'm going to invite you all to hear this liturgy. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and are given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without a price. I present Luna this morning for baptism. And so I'm going to ask her parents who I met with in my office and told me what their desires are as parents. And Sherry was there with them and Jackie was there with them. And we talked about their heart's desire to be not just good people, role models to Luna, but they want to give a, um, a Christian example uh, for Luna. And so on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce your spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, O.C. and Carenza, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess that Jesus is your Savior, put the whole, your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord, in union with the church that Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. Will you nurture baby Luna? And I know you will. In Christ's church, that by your teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for her, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. Do you, as Christ's body, reaffirm your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? And the words are on the screen. Will you nurture one another in Christian faith and life to include this beautiful family before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may know to be true disciples and walk in the way that leads to life. I invite you to join that, me now in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
he descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin. Let us pray. You know, poor Pam. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those of the ark through water. After the flood, you set the clouds and the rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to three freedom through the sea, and your children you brought through the Jordan. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus to the womb. He was baptized by John the Spirit. In the baptism of his death and resurrection, all disciples. So God, now pour out your holy water, baby Luna, as she receives it. Clothe for the of her life that dying and be raised in Christ, she may share in his final victory. Amen. And so if it's okay with you all, I take baby Luna. Oh, baby Luna. Oh, it's okay. All my children have cried at me when I took them. Yeah. Baby Luna, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And may God do his mighty work in your life, baby Luna, for the whole of your life so that you understand his love and grace for you. Amen. Amen. Okay. Let's give God thanks for this day. God, we want to thank you again for the gift of life, for this beautiful family, for the family and friends who stand with them. Lord, we thank you for the words that we have together coveted around baby Luna. So now we thank you for her life and pray that as she grows in your grace, that in each of our lives she will see who you are, God, and be inspired to live as one who is faithful to Christ. We thank you and we praise you and we ask our prayer now in the name of Christ. Amen. This morning we have gifts for you. We have a certificate for baby Luna. We have a little pink, her first little pink Bible. Yeah, it has her name and everything in there for her. And we have a bouquet of flowers for you to celebrate and remember this day. God bless you all. Let's give this family a hand. Give God praise for them. God bless you all. And as you return to your seat, we're going to invite the church to stand as you were able for our closing song of praise this day. It's an invitation to be those who are prepared for the second coming of Christ, the summons. If you look in your um, faith we sing, you'll find it there. 2130, the summons. 2130, we're going to sing together. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? All five verses. Will you come and follow me? If I would call your name, will you go where you don't know when men would be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my love be grown in you? Will you leave yourself behind if I would call your name? Will you care for cruel and kind and never be the same? Will you risk the hostile stay? Should you like a tractor's gear? Will you let the blinded see if I would call your name? Will you set the prisoner free and then will be the same? Will you kiss the leper clean and do so? 
much as there's some sea and admit to what I need in me and you in me. Will you love the you you hide but but call your name? Will you quell the fear inside and never be the same? My side and touch and sound in you and you me. Lord, your summons echoes true when you would call my name. Let me turn and follow you and never be the same in your company. I'll move and live and grow with you and you and me. I invite you now, church, to go forth as those sensible, righteous, and godly with a blessed hope and the expectation of Christ Jesus' return, living in the fullness of God's grace and equipping power. Go forth now. Amen. Amen.